ask this. Are you kidding about all these incredibly cruel punishments and rules? Was the question Klaus thought of, but he already knew that the answer was no. Only Violet thought of a question that seemed useful to ask. I have a question, Vice Principal Nero, she said. Where do we live? Nero's response was so predictable that the Baudelaire orphans could have said it along with this miserable administrator. Where do we live? He said in his high, mocking tone. But when he was done making fun of the children, he decided to answer it. We have a magnificent dormitory here at Proofrock Prep, he said. You can't miss it. It's a gray building, entirely made of stone, and shaped like a big toe. Inside is a huge living room with a brick fireplace, a game room, and a large lending library. Every student has his or her own room with a bowl of fresh fruit placed there every Wednesday. Doesn't that sound nice? Yes, it does, Klaus admitted. Keeb, Sonny shrieked, which meant something along the lines of, I like fruit. I'm glad you think so. Nero said, although you won't get to see much of the place. In order to live in the dormitory, you must have a permission slip with the signature of a parent or guardian. Your parents are dead, and Mr. Poe tells me that your guardians have either been killed or have fired you. But surely Mr. Poe can sign our permission slip, Violet said. He surely cannot, Nero replied. He is neither your parent nor your guardian. He is a banker who is in charge of your affairs. But that's more or less the same thing, Klaus protested. That's more or less the same thing, Nero mimicked. Perhaps after a few semesters at Proofrock Prep, you'll learn the difference between a parent and a banker. No, I'm afraid you'll have to live in a small shack <laughs> made entirely of tin. Inside, there is no living room, no game room, and no lending library whatsoever. You three will each have your own bale of hay to sleep on, but no fruit. It's a dismal place. But Mr. Poe tells me you've had a number of uncomfortable experiences, so I figured you'd be used to such things. Couldn't you please make an exception? Violet asked. I'm a violinist, Nero cried. I have no time to make exceptions. I'm too busy practicing the violin. So if you will kindly leave my office, I can get back to work. Klaus opened his mouth to say something more. But when he looked at Nero, he knew that there was no use saying another word to such a stubborn man and he glumly followed his sisters out of the vice principal's office. When the office door shut behind them, however, vice principal Nero said another word, and he said it three times. The three children listened to these three words that he said, and knew for certain that he had not been sorry at all. For as soon as the Baudelaire's left the office and Nero thought he was alone, he said to himself, He, he, he. Now, the vice principal of Prufrock Preparatory School did not actually say the syllables he, 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 of course. Whenever you see the words he, he, he in a book, or ha, 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 or har, 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 or he, 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 or even ho, 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 those words mean somebody was laughing. In this case, however, the words he, he, he cannot really describe what Vice Principal Nero's laugh sounded like. The laugh was squeaky, and it was wheezy, and it had a rough, crackly edge to it, as if Nero were eating tin cans as he laughed at the children. But most of all, the laugh sounded cruel. It is always cruel to laugh at people, of course, although sometimes if they are wearing an ugly hat, it is hard to control yourself. But the Baudelaire's were not wearing ugly hats. There were young children receiving bad news, and if Vice Principal Nero really had to laugh at them, he should have been able to control himself until the siblings were out of earshot. But Nero didn't care about controlling himself, and as the Baudelaire orphans listened to the laugh, they realized that what their father had said to them that night, when he'd come home from the symphony, was wrong. There was a worse sound in the world than somebody who cannot play the violin insisting on doing so anyway. The sound of an administrator laughing a squeaky, wheezy, rough, crackly, cruel laugh at children who have to live in a shack was much, much worse. So as I hide out here in this mountain cabin and write the words, he, 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 and you, wherever you are hiding out, read the words, he, 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 stands for the worst sound the Baudelaire's had ever heard. Chapter 3 The expression, making a mountain out of a molehill, simply means making a big deal out of something that is actually a small deal and it is easy to see how this expression came about. Molehills are simply mounds of earth serving as condominiums for moles, 
and they have never caused anyone any harm except for maybe a stubbed toe if you were walking through the wilderness without any shoes on. Mountains, however, are very large mounds of earth and are constantly causing problems. They are very tall, and when people try to climb them, they often fall off or get lost and die of starvation. Sometimes, two countries fight over who really owns a mountain, and thousands of people have to go to war and come home grumpy or wounded. And, of course, mountains serve as homes to mountain goats and mountain lions, who enjoy attacking helpless picnickers and eating sandwiches or children. So when someone is making a mountain out of a molehill, they are pretending that something is as horrible as a war or a ruined picnic when it is really only as horrible as a stubbed toe. When the Baudelaire orphans reached the shack where they were going to live, however, they realized that Vice Principal Nero hadn't been making a mountain out of a molehill at all when he had said that the shack was a dismal place. If anything, he had been making a molehill out of a mountain. It was true that the shack was tiny, as Nero had said, and made of tin, and it was true that there was no living room, no game room, and no lending library. It was true that there were three bales of hay instead of beds, and that there was absolutely no fresh fruit in sight. But Vice Principal Nero had left out a few details in his description, and it was these details that made the shack even worse. The first detail the Baudelaire's noticed was that the shack was infested with small crabs, each one about the size of a matchbox, scurrying around the wooden floor with their tiny claws snapping in the air. As the children walked across the shack to sit glumly on one of the bales of hay, they were disappointed to learn that the crabs were territorial, a word which here means unhappy to see small children in their living quarters. The crabs gathered around the children and began snapping their claws at them. Luckily, the crabs did not have very good aim, and luckily, their claws were so small that they probably wouldn't hurt any more than a good strong pinch. But even if they were more or less harmless, they did not make for a good shack. When the children reached the bale of hay and sat down, tucking their legs up under them to avoid the snapping crabs, they looked up at the ceiling and saw another detail Nero had neglected to mention. Some sort of fungus was growing on the ceiling, a fungus that was light tan and quite damp. Every few seconds, small drops of moisture would fall from the fungus with a pop, and the children had to duck to avoid getting light tan fungus juice on them. Like the small crabs, the plop in fungus did not appear to be very harmful, but also like the small crabs, the fungus made the shack even more uncomfortable than the vice principal had described it. And lastly, as the children sat on the bale of hay with their legs tucked beneath them and ducked to avoid fungus juice, they saw one more harmless but unpleasant detail of the shack that was worse than Nero had led them to believe, and that was the color of the walls. Each tin wall was bright green, with tiny pink hearts painted here and there as if the shack were an enormous, tacky Valentine's Day card instead of a place to live, and the Baudelaire's found that they would rather look at the bales of hay, or the small crabs on the floor, or even the light tan fungus on the ceiling than the ugly walls. Overall, the shack was too miserable to serve as a storage place for old banana peels, let alone as a home for three young people. And I confess that if I had been told that it was my home, I probably would have lain on the bales of hay and thrown a temper tantrum. But the Baudelaire's had learned long ago that temper tantrums, however fun they may be to throw, rarely solve whatever problem is causing them. So after a long, miserable silence, the orphans tried to look at their situation in a more positive light. This isn't such a nice room, Violet said finally. But if I put my mind to it, I bet I can invent something that can keep these crabs away from us. And I'm going to read up on this light hand fungus, Klaus said. Maybe the dormitory library has information on how to stop it from dripping. Ivosair, Sonny said, which meant something like, I bet I can use my four sharp teeth to scrape this paint away and make the walls a bit less ugly. Klaus gave his baby sister a little kiss on the top of her head. At least we get to go to school, he pointed out. I've missed being in a real classroom. Me too, Violet agreed. And at least we'll meet some people our own age. We've only had the company of adults for quite some time. Wanik, Sonny said, which probably meant, and learning secretarial skills is an exciting opportunity for me, although I should really be in nursery school instead. That's true, Klaus said, and who knows? Maybe the advanced computer really can keep Ken Olaf away, and that's the most important thing of all. You're right, Violet said. Any room that doesn't have Count Olaf in it is good enough for me. Olo, Sonny said, which meant even if it's ugly, damp, and filled with crabs. The children sighed and then sat quietly for a few moments. The shack was quiet, 
except for the snapping of tiny crab claws, the plop of fungus, and the size of the Baudelaire's as they looked at the ugly walls. Try as they might, the youngsters just couldn't make the shack into a molehill. No matter how much they thought of real classrooms, people their own age, or the exciting opportunity of secretarial skills, their new home seemed much, much worse than even the sorest of stubbed toes. Well, Klaus said after a while, it feels like it's about lunchtime. Remember, if we're late, they take away our cups and glasses, so we should probably get a move on. Those rules are ridiculous, Violet said, ducking to avoid a pop. Lunchtime isn't a specific time, so you can't be late for it. It's just a word that means around lunch. I know, Klaus said. And the part about Sunny being punished for going to the administrative building when she has to go there to be Nero's secretary is completely absurd. Calc, Sunny said, putting her little hand on her brother's knee. She meant something like, don't worry about it, I'm a baby, so I hardly ever use silverware. It doesn't matter that it'll be taken away from me. Ridiculous rules or not, the orphans did not want to be punished, so the three of them walked gingerly, the word gingerly here means avoiding territorial crabs, across the shack and out onto the brown lawn. Gym class must have been over, because all the running children were gone, and this only made the Baudelaire's walk even more quickly to the cafeteria. Several years before this story took place, when Violet was ten and Klaus was eight and Sonny was not even a fetus, the Baudelaire family went to a county fair in order to see a pig that their uncle Elwyn had entered in a contest. The pig contest turned out to be a bit dull, but in the neighboring tent there was another contest that the family found quite interesting, the biggest lasagna contest. The lasagna that won the blue ribbon had been baked by eleven nuns and was as big and soft as a large mattress. Perhaps because they were at such an impressionable age. The phrase impressionable age here means ten and eight years old, respectively. Violet and Klaus always remembered this lasagna, and they were sure they would never see another one anywhere near as big. Violet and Klaus were wrong. When the Baudelaire entered the cafeteria, they found a lasagna waiting for them that was the size of a dance floor. It was sitting on top of an enormous trivet to keep it from burning the floor, and the person serving it was wearing a thick metal mask as protection so that the children could only see their eyes peeking out from tiny eye holes. The stunned Baudelaire's got into a long line of children and waited their turn for the metal-masked person to scoop lasagna onto ugly plastic trays and hand it wordlessly to the children. After receiving their lasagna, the orphans walked further down the line and helped themselves to green salad, which was waiting for them in a bowl the size of a pickup truck. Next to the salad was a mountain of garlic bread, and at the end of the line was another metal-masked person, handing out silverware to the students who had not been inside the administrative building. The Baudelaire said thank you to the person, who gave them a slow metallic nod in return. They took a long look around the crowded cafeteria. Hundreds of children had already received their lasagna and were sitting at long, rectangular tables. The Baudelaire saw several other children who had undoubtedly been in the administrative building, because they had no silverware. They saw several more students who had their hands tied behind their backs as punishment for being late to class and they saw several students who had a sad look on their faces, as if they had been forced to buy somebody a bag of candy and watch them eat it, and the orphans guessed that these students had failed to show up to one of Nero's six-hour concerts. But it was none of these punishments that made the Baudelaire orphans pause for so long. It was the fact that they did not know where to sit. Cafeterias can be confusing places because there are different rules for each one, and sometimes it is difficult to know where one should eat. Normally, the Baudelaire's would simply eat with one of their friends, but their friends were far, far away from Prufrock Preparatory School, and Violet, Klaus, and Sonny gazed around the cafeteria full of strangers and thought they might never put down their ugly trays. Finally, they caught the eye of the girl they had seen on the lawn and who had called them such a strange name and walked a few steps toward her. Now, you and I know that this loathsome little girl was Carmelita Spatz, but the Baudelaire's had not been properly introduced to her and so did not realize just how loathsome she was although as the orphans drew closer, she gave them an instant education. Don't even think of eating around here, you cake sniffers! <laughs> Carmelita Spatz cried, and several of her rude, filthy, violent friends nodded in agreement. Nobody wants to have lunch with people who live in the orphan's shack! I'm terribly sorry, Klaus said, although he wasn't terribly sorry at all. I didn't mean to disturb you. <laughs> Carmelita, who had apparently never been to the administrative building, picked up her silverware, and began to bang it on her tray in a rhythmic and irritating way. Cake-sniffing orphans in the orphan shack! 
cake sniffing orphans in me orphan shack, she chanted, and to the Baudelaire's dismay, many other children joined right in. Like many other rude, violent, filthy people, Carmelita Spatz had a bunch of friends who were always happy to help her torment people, probably to avoid being tormented themselves. In a few seconds, it seemed like the entire cafeteria was banging their silverware and chanting, Cake sniffing orphans in me orphan shack! The three siblings stepped closer together, craning their necks to see if there was any possible place so to which great. they could escape and eat their lunch in peace. Oh, leave them alone, Carmelita, a voice cried over the chanting. The Baudelaire's turned around and saw a boy with very dark hair and very wide eyes. He looked a little older than Klaus and a little younger than Violet and had a dark green notebook tucked into a pocket of his thick wool sweater. You're the cake sniffer and nobody in their right mind would want to eat with you anyway. Come on the boy said, turning to the Baudelaire's. There's room at our table. Thank you very much, Violet said in relief, and followed the boy to a table that had plenty of room. He sat down next to a girl who looked absolutely identical to the boy. She looked about the same age, and also had very dark hair, very wide eyes, and a notebook tucked into the pocket of her thick wool sweater. The only difference seemed to be that the girl's notebook was pitch black. Seeing two people who look so much alike is a little bit eerie, but it was better than looking at Carmelita Spatz, so the Baudelaire sat down across from them and introduced themselves. I'm Violet Baudelaire, said Violet Baudelaire, and this is my brother Klaus and our baby sister, Sunny. It's nice to meet you, said the boy. My name is Duncan Quagmire, and this is my sister, Isadora, and the girl who was yelling at you, I'm sorry to say, was Carmelita Spatz. She didn't seem very nice, Klaus said. That is the understatement of the century, Isadora said. Carmelita Spatz is rude, filthy, and violent, and the less time you spend with her, the happier you will be. Read the Baudelaire's the poem you wrote about her, Duncan said to his sister. You write poetry? Klaus asked. He had read a lot about poets, but he had never met one. Just a little bit, Isadora said modestly. I write poems down in this notebook. It's an interest of mine. Sappho! Sunny shrieked, which meant something like, I'd be very pleased to hear a poem of yours. Klaus explained to the quagmires what Sunny meant, and Isadora smiled and opened her notebook. It's a very short poem, she said. Only two rhyming lines. That's called a couplet, Klaus said. I learned that from a book of literary criticism. Yes, I know, Isadora said, and then read her poem, leaning forward so Carmelita Spatz would not overhear. I would rather eat a bowl of vampire bats than spend an hour with Carmelita Spatz. The Baudelaire's giggled and then covered their mouths so nobody would know they were laughing at Carmelita. That was great, Klaus said. I like the part about the bowl of bats. Thanks, Isadora said. I would be interested in reading that book of literary criticism you told me about. Would you let me borrow it? Klaus looked down. I can't, he said. That book belonged to my father and it was destroyed in a fire. The Quagmires looked at one another and their eyes grew even wider. I'm very sorry to hear that, Duncan said. My sister and I have been through a terrible fire, so we know what that's like. Did your father die in the fire? Yes, he did, Klaus said, and my mother too. Isadora put down her fork, reached across the table, and patted Klaus on the hand. Normally, this might have embarrassed Klaus a little bit, but under the circumstances, it felt perfectly natural. I'm so sorry to hear that, she said. Our parents died in a fire as well. It's awful to miss your parents so much, isn't it? Bloney. Sonny said, nodding. For a long time, Duncan admitted, I was afraid of any kind of fire. I didn't even like to look at stoves. Violet smiled. We stayed with a woman for a while, our Aunt Josephine, who was afraid of stoves. She was afraid that they might explode. Explode, Duncan said. Even I wasn't afraid as all that. Why aren't you staying with your Aunt Josephine now? Now it was Violet's turn to look down, and Duncan's turn to reach across the table and take her hand. She died too, Violet said. To tell you the truth, Duncan, our lives have been very topsy-turvy for quite some time. I'm very sorry to hear it, Duncan said, and I wish I could tell you that things will get better here. But between Vice Principal Nero playing the violin, Carmelita Spatz teasing us, and the dreadful orphan's shack, Proofrock Prep is a pretty miserable place. I think it's awful to call it the orphan's shack, Klaus said. It's a bad enough place without giving it an insulting nickname. The nickname is more of Carmelita's handiwork, I'm sorry to say, Isadora said. Duncan and I had to live there for three semesters because we needed a parent or guardian to sign our permission slip, and we didn't have one. That's the same thing that happened to us, Violet cried. 
and when we asked Nero to make an exception, he said he was too busy practicing the violin, Isadora said, nodding as she finished Violet's sentence. He always says that. Anyway, Carmelita called at the orphan shack when we were living there, and it looks like she's going to keep on doing it. Well, Violet sighed, Carmelita's nasty names are the least of our problems in the shack. How did you deal with the crabs when you lived there? Duncan let go of her hand to take his notebook out of his pocket. I use my notebook to take notes on things, he explained. I plan to be a newspaper reporter when I get a little older, and I figure it's good to start practicing. Here it is, notes on the crabs. They're afraid of loud noises, you see, so I have a list of things we did to scare them away from us. Afraid of loud noises, Violet repeated, and tied her hair up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes. When she ties her hair up like that, Klaus explained to the quagmires, it means she's thinking of an invention. My sister is quite an inventor. How about noisy shoes, Violet said suddenly. If we took small pieces of metal and glued them to our shoes, then wherever we walked we would make a loud noise, and I bet we'd hardly ever see those crabs. Noisy shoes, Duncan cried. Isadora and I lived in the orphan shack all that time and never thought of noisy shoes. He took a pencil out of his pocket and wrote noisy shoes in the dark green notebook, and then turned to Paige. I do have a list of fungus books that are in the school library, if you need help with that tan stuff on the ceiling. Zotwal, Sonny shrieked. We'd love to see the library, Violet translated. It sure is lucky that we ran into you two twins. Duncan's and Isadora's faces fell, an expression which does not mean that the front part of their heads actually fell to the ground. It simply means that the two siblings suddenly looked very sad. What's wrong? Klaus asked. Did we say something that upset you? Twins, Duncan said, so softly that the Baudelaire's could barely hear him. You are twins, aren't you? Violet asked. You look just alike. We're triplets, Isadora said sadly. I'm confused, Violet said. Aren't triplets three people born at the same time? We were three people born at the same time, Isadora explained but our brother Quigley died in the fire that killed our parents. I'm very sorry to hear that, Klaus said. Please forgive our calling you twins. We meant no disrespect to Quigley's memory. Of course you didn't, Duncan said, giving the Baudelaire's a small smile. There's no way you could have known. Come on, if you're done with your lasagna, we'll show you the library. And maybe we can find some pieces of metal, Isadora said, for noisy shoes. The Baudelaire orphans smiled, and the five of them bust their trays and walked out of the cafeteria. The library turned out to be a very pleasant place, but it was not the comfortable chairs, the huge wooden bookshelves, or the hush of people reading that made the three siblings feel so good as they walked into the room. It is useless for me to tell you about the brass lamps and the shapes of different fish, or the bright blue curtains that rippled like water as a breeze came in from the window, because although these were wonderful things, they were not what made the three children smile. The quagmire triplets were smiling, too and although I have not researched the quagmires nearly as much as I have the Baudelaire's, I can say with reasonable accuracy that they were smiling for the same reason. It is a relief, in hectic and frightening times, to find true friends, and it was this relief that all five children were feeling as the quagmires gave the Baudelaire's a tour of the Prufrock Library. Friends can make you feel that the world is smaller and less sneaky than it really is, because you know people who have had similar experiences a phrase which here means having lost family members in terrible fires and lived in the orphan's shack. As Duncan and Isadora whispered to Violet, Klaus, and Sonny, explaining how the library was organized, the Baudelaire children felt less and less distressed about their new circumstances, and by the time Duncan and Isadora were recommending their favorite books, the three siblings thought that perhaps their troubles were coming to an end at last. They were wrong about this, of course, but for the moment it didn't matter. The Baudelaire orphans had found friends, and as they stood in the library with the quagmire triplets, the world felt smaller and safer than it had for a long, long time. Chapter 4 If you have walked into a museum recently, whether you did so to attend an art exhibition or to escape from the police, you may have noticed a type of painting known as a triptych. A triptych has three panels with something different painted on each of the panels. 